everyone. My name is Cynthia Peterson, and I am the out-of-home care and youth program manager for the Child Welfare Information Gateway. And I'm also the project coordinator for the NRC for in-home services. On behalf of the NRC for in-home services, we want to welcome you to today's webinar, Safety Organized Practice, a Collaborative Practice Model and In-Home Services. Before we get started, our operator, Karina, will cover the logistics of today's webinar. Karina? Thanks, Cynthia. I will explain a few of the audio and video capabilities for this webinar. We will leave time at the end of the presentation for questions. There are two ways you can ask a question. In the control panel at the top right corner of your screen, there is a feature that allows you to raise your hand if you want to be recognized or type in a question in the chat box. Feel free to use those features at any time. To ask a question over the phone, press star 1 on your telephone keypad. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and will be available on the NRC In-Home Services website. If we don't get to your question, a question and answer document will be developed and posted on the NRC's website along with today's PowerPoint presentation. Now I will turn the meeting over to Pamela Day, the Senior Project Consultant for the NRC for In-Home Services. Pam? Hi, everyone, and welcome. We're delighted to have you with us and uh, to also have our, our panelists who will be, you'll be hearing from very shortly. I want to tell you just briefly about the National Resource Center for In-Home Services. We are um, in a center of uh, training and technical assistance, part of the Children's Bureau's TNTA network. And we focus, as you might gather, on ensuring the safety and well-being of children and youth in their families and in their, in their communities, preventing the initial placement or of children out of, in out-of-home care, and certainly uh, focusing on um, promoting um, reunification uh, re and preventing reentry into foster care. So, of course, we, we care a lot about preserving, supporting, and stabilizing families so that children can remain safely with them. The webinar that we're presenting today uh, has, was is it on a topic of great interest to the National Resource Center, and I think to many of us. It really um, helps us to think about um, a, a question that's probably been a perennial question in child welfare, and that is, how can we keep children safely with their families and in their communities? Um, what what are the tools? What are the practice strategies? What is a good approach for making this happen on a day-to-day -day basis in communities all over the country, helping workers to know how to do that well, providing the supervision and the structure they need, and really creating a whole philosophy of practice that ensures that we are achieving this goal. So we're delighted to be able to um, share with you um, group from Northern California, uh, led by Susan Brooks, and um, they will be talking about our um, their work in safety, uh, implementing, planning and implementing safety organized practice in, in several counties in, in California. And I will mention that um, they are not alone, as Susan will tell you. Uh, in fact, uh, 48 counties in California are currently um, involved in implementing this approach. Um, it's not brand new in the sense that many of the elements you will be familiar with, but we think it's an exciting way of putting those elements together. Our objectives today are to describe the concept of safety organized practice in child welfare and in in-home in services and how it is being implemented in, in these northern California counties, to share strategies that have resulted in successful implementation. This is not a small task. <laughs> these folks have been carrying out, and to share early outcomes of the effort, um, including how it has added value for workers and families, and how it has enriched the social work, their social work practice. This is a tall order in our short period of time, but we're confident we can do it. So I want to move forward and introduce Susan Brooks. Um, Susan will be um, our lead person on the webinar. Um, she is uh, the director of the Northern California Training Academy at the Center for Human Services, UC Davis Extension in California. 
She has nearly 30 years of experience in social services with expertise in substance abuse, child welfare, collaboration, team building, supervision, and we suspect quite a bit more. For seven years, um, Susan Brooks supervised the multidisciplinary team for children's services in San Mateo County in California. Susan will be introducing her other presenters to you, so I hand it over to Susan. Thank you so much, and thank you again for the opportunity to do uh, this presentation today. Um, so again, our greetings to all that are listening to the webinar. Um, my colleague Holly Bowers and Nancy Hafer will be joining me in the um, overview of the foundational piece of the um, presentation, and then my three colleagues um, from counties of which whom I'll introduce a little bit later will be joining um, to give us some stories from the field. Um, first of all, I really want to acknowledge that um, uh, one of the pieces that was stated is, is that safety organized practice has really been a learning journey and taking some of the um, key practices and evidence-based practices that we know in the field and really looking at how we can adapt those practices to be most effective in the field of child welfare. And that work has been done in partnership with many colleagues, um, too many to really speak to, but also in partnership with uh, the larger training system within California, which is um, made up of four um, other universities um, who have worked very closely to ensure that um, the practice has been developed and implemented with fidelity in the 48 counties throughout the state. So I want to be sure to acknowledge their work and thank them for the continued partnership. Um, really take the organized practice, the goals of the practice as they align with in-home supportive services is really supporting, developing and supporting a network of support for families. Um, we know that child welfare is in the family uh, life for just a moment in time in the scheme of things, and so really developing and enhancing their own support systems is critical to keeping children um, safe in the long term. Assessing and, ensure, and ensuring that children are safe from harm, avoiding entry into care, decreasing the time to reunification and reducing reentry into care are um, some of the primary um, practice goals of safety organized practice. And as you can see, those are very much in line with in-home supportive services, which is to prevent removal and placement of children, to reduce reentry into care, and to stabilize families um, as best as we can. Um, I would say there's really three principles of practice and safety organized practice. Um, it's really look at increasing um, uh, collaboration and critical thinking. Um, among all partners involved in, um, in working with and in partnership with families, um, enhancing safety for children and families wherever possible, and then, again, not only engaging but really involving children and families in, um, in the life changes, behavior changes that are needed to keep children in safe. And expanding on that a little bit, enhancing safety is really the assessment of risk and safety um, from the very beginning until case closure, preventing entry into care if safety can be provided whenever possible, um, creating, again, safety networks of support for that family, both in creating them, sustaining them, and deepening their clarity and roles and responsibilities, um, safety planning so that there's a clear and articulated plan of support and safety for children, and focusing on behaviors versus services. Traditionally, child welfare has um, focused on uh, making sure that a certain number of services were available to families, but not necessarily providing the clarity to which those services were to address the behavior changes that were needed by the caregivers to keep children safe. So uh, the second one is increasing critical thinking. Um, and critical thinking in the practice is done in a number of ways. Um, first is really uh, an information and consultation framework um, and or safety mapping. Um, it's uh, referred to in both ways. Sue Lorbach uh, from Minnesota, uh, Olmstead County in Minnesota, and her colleagues really developed the information and consultation framework. Uh, safety mapping concept comes from Andrew Chanel's work. But again, it's really looking at um, uh, a, a same way of gathering and sorting information. Um, and this particular slide really outlines 
this particular uh, 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 PowerPoint uh, slide really outlines um, what would be included in the safety mapping or information framework. So if you look on the bottom right-hand side, you'll see um, what's noted there is the purpose and focus of the consultation. Um, and that's really critical. Oftentimes, not everybody who's involved in um, a particular family meeting or a particular consultation is really clear about what the purpose is. So it's starting out by having clarity of purpose is critical. And then as you gather information in partnership with the family, or even if you do it as a consultation between a supervisor and social worker or in group supervision, um, it's getting uh, clarity about the reason for referral, being clear about what the details are, um, and what brought that family to the attention of the child welfare agency. And then beginning to sort the information that you get. Um, determining if the information rises to a level of harm and danger um, and, and risk related to that particular child, um, or are the issues presenting more of issues related to complicating factors. Some, th some complicating factors can be long-term chronic issues that don't necessarily impact the direct safety of a child, but certainly are issues of concern that we want to be sure to keep on the radar. If you go to the right-hand side, we want to again begin to clarify what particular factors of a family have provided or mitigated against the harm and danger or safety risks that we've identified that actually provide safety, and what are things that within the family structure are strengths um, or protective factors, but currently don't rise to the level of actually providing safety or preventing or addressing specifically the harm and danger that we've identified in the family, but potentially could be built on in the future to rise to that level of providing safety. If you look in the middle of it, both sides, the right and the left, kind of fold into the middle piece if you think of it that way. Um, it's really being clear and starting with the genogram, being clear about who is involved with that family, and who that family identifies as their system of support. And I particularly really like the gray area part of the um, framework because oftentimes as social workers, we begin to speculate and to try to fill in the gaps of information um, that we uh, have identified without necessarily doing or, or gathering enough information to make determinations. And so the gray area is an area where we can identify additional questions or additional information we might need to seek to find out to provide information to help us determine um, uh, what type of response is needed, and that also helps us prevent from speculating um, uh, on the case. And then below is really the next steps, is really ranking the what, who, when, and where needs to happen to address those issues that we've identified as being risk um, or harm and danger to that particular family. Um, again, the critical thinking um, continues through a process of harm, danger, and risk statements. And again, that's, those are clear behaviorally based statements that um, uh, looking at what the caregiver's actions, um, what behavior have they, um, have they demonstrated, and what those behaviors, what the impact has been directly on the child. So being really clear with um, the family and in partnership with the family, what are specific concerns about the behaviors that the caregiver has demonstrated and how that has negatively impacted the safety of that child. In California, we primarily use structured decision making. And, that, um, and this practice really, again, uses structured decision making as one of the tools of assessing risk and safety and ensuring that at each of those decision points, we're really taking in consideration um, what the structured decision making tools would provide in terms of guidance. We also use to support critical thinking issues around group supervision and then most importantly, facilitated family meetings that um, all meetings with families are critical and they should begin at the very beginning of, me of a referral to the agency and having a clear facilitation process with clear goals and clear um, expectations um, is very helpful in terms of engagement and in terms of working with the family. So then the engagement, involvement in children and caregivers and their network of support um, is one of the other areas that I spoke to of one of the three. Again, it includes family meetings and family meetings with their network of support. So whoever the family identifies, whether they're friends, families, neighbors, 
um, community-based organizations, that they're a part of that network and that they're at the table as part of family meetings to provide support, that during these meetings decisions and services are discussed and, and provided, that concrete um, support and informal connections continually are identified in partnership with the family that can be in that family's life in the long term. And then social and emotional connections continue to be supported. And lastly, um, uh, an element called three houses, which is one strategy for involving children's voice into decision making. The three houses is something that was developed by Nikki Wells in New Zealand. And I would highly encourage um, a more investigative reading of her work. But the three houses is, again, a really critical tool um, that can be used of gathering information. And we'll talk a little bit more about it in a minute, but gathering information from children to include in all process of, the, um, of working with the family. Um, there are three questions that really guide the practice. Um, and these are questions that are used with the family, in supervision, even at an organizational level can be used, uh, are very effective. And the first question is, what are we worried about? Is asking that family what things are they worried about as we're working with them and noting what those are. Um, the next question is, what's working well within that family? And then lastly, what do we want to do? What next steps do we need to take to address those issues in which we have identified that not only is the family worried about, but we as an organization, as a child protection agency, might be worried about as well. We really think of safety organized practice as a collaborative practice model that's grounded in several evidence-based and evidence-informed practices. And so motivational interviewing, again, um, strategies for dealing with resistance, solution-focused practice, again, critical, um, especially when you look at issues around scaling questions, the miracle question, coping questions. These are things that are key strategies for uh, in the framework of safety organized practice. The concept of cultural humility, which I'll address a bit further, appreciative inquiry, really engaging and including trauma-informed services, um, risk and safety assessment tools, whether you use structured decision making or you use another type of actuarial tool, but having a clear way where you consistently um, are assessing the risk and safety throughout from beginning to end of, with that family. Family meetings are a critical element, um, and that inclusion of family networks, again, very critical uh, to a, an effective practice. And then lastly, strategies for engaging children and children's voice and perspective in decision making. And one of the key strategies, again, is using three houses of Nikki Wells. Um, cultural humility, and again, this is a body of work that comes from the health field, but also we were fortunate to work with Dr. Ortega at the University of Michigan School of Social Work, who has done a lot of um, work on cultural humility. Um, there's really kind of two components of cultural humility. One is certainly the social worker's responsibility to have an understanding and skills and cross-cultural interactions and communication, but as important is um, the social worker's understanding of their own perspective and their own biases and what um, has shaped their own life and their own culture and what they bring to the table. And really the meshing of those two issues um, together into practice is what helps social workers be uh, effective in working with a diverse group of uh, communities and families. And again, I would encourage people to see Dr. Ortega's work at the University of um, Michigan. Um, one of the areas that we continue to um, still, I think, develop. It's uh, certainly been a growing field, and we certainly have not mastered this particular area as part of safety organized practice, but it's the trauma-informed interventions. And we've been fortunate enough to work with Chadwick Center at the Rady Children's Hospital. Um, they have several publications out that are incredibly useful. Um, one of them is Guidelines to Applying Trauma Lens to Child Welfare Practice Models. And um, again, looking at how we can identify trauma both in children and families, and then what we need to do as we work with families to address those um, traumas that have occurred, and then more, and just as importantly as an agency ensuring that we don't um, add on any additional trauma to the life of the children and families that we're working with. I spoke a little bit about the three houses. 
Um, and again, the three houses are modeled very much like the framework in terms of the three questions, which is house of good things, um, house of worries, and the house of dreams. So um, the house of good things um, and the house of worries in particular allow children to be able to draw or communicate or write um, either themselves or, or in partnership with the social worker to identify what they feel in their life that they're worried about, what's going well for them, and then where their worries are, and a great deal of information um, can be gathered from that, that it helps inform decision making. It also is very helpful um, in terms of working with caregivers for caregivers to see reflected back to them the, um, the words of their own child around what they're worried about and what's going well. The House of Dreams is really about what they would like to see or what they see as being the solution um, for their, their family in terms of addressing the things that they're worried about. I would say one of the most powerful things about the three houses, and one of my colleagues will speak a little bit more about this later, is just as, as important as having the child's perspective and voice uh, for the child to have an opportunity to express their feelings is for the parent to have reflected back to them in their children's own words um, what, they, uh, what they see and what they have experienced. And again, these tools help put together uh, and can inform a safety plan, particularly um, the House of Dreams can provide some guidance from the child's perspective about how to keep that child safe um, within that family system. And that safety plans need to be grounded. And um, need to be grounded in the children's voice. And so again, this is work that's done by Nikki Weld, and I would highly encourage people to um, look closer at her work. Um, the next piece is a little bit more information about the inclusion of family networks. This work is done by Susie Essex. Um, and this is really exciting work as well. I think particularly in wraparound services, we've always identified and known about having networks of support. But this kind of moves it to the next level with some really simple strategies. Um, it's really thinking about the child uh, um, and who in that particular child's life can be supportive of them. I think in child welfare practice, oftentimes we've asked parents who are in their lives that are supportive. And parents' response can often be, well, they have no one in their life that's supportive. And that may, in fact, be true um, given some of their histories. But it's very rare that a parent can identify people in their lives that's not, um, that does not care about their child and can be supportive of their child. So this is a process of really identifying who in that child's life knows everything that's going on with that child, who knows a little bit about what's going on with that child, and who knows nothing about what's going on with that child and that family. Um, and it is about identifying those people, their roles in that child's life, and what level of information they know. And then working with the, um, with the caregivers about who within that family safety circle can be moved in to support them and their child um, in um, the work ahead around keeping that child safe. This diagram just illustrates what one might look like um, in, real, uh, in, in a real situation where you can see it's been completed. And again, the roles and responsibilities of each of the individuals identified um, have been outlined. This is also particularly helpful to have this visual um, uh, 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 piece of work as part of the case plan. As we often know, social workers change throughout the life of the case. And often it's difficult in complex family systems to just keep track of everybody. Um, and so this is really a good way of keeping track of who all is in the family network, if it does become necessary to look at placement options, this information can be used to identify possible placements. Um, and again, it's the goal of Relay Family Network is to continue to work with that family, to have that network of support step up to the table to provide support in the long run. One of the things that's very different than just asking social workers um, who, pe who would they call it to in the morning if they um, are feeling frustrated, and to have a caregiver or a parent say, well, I'll call my mother, 
Um, and then as a social worker, we might document, oh, the parent's going to call their mother. But really, Family Safety Networks is about the mother being, the grandmother being a part of that decision, the grandmother knowing that she's going to be the person who called at 2 in the morning, that the grandmother's prepared to respond, and how what her response or responsibilities would be. And all of that is clearly outlined as a strong safety network of support is established um, so that there's no questions about individual roles and responsibilities of that network of support. So now um, the most important part of the webinar is really hearing the stories from the field. And I'm very um, excited to have three colleagues um, with me today who are going to speak. Um, the first one is Marianne Kubiak, who's a program manager in Sacramento County. Sacramento County is um, one of the larger counties in Northern California. Um, as you can see by the slide, they have a total child population of three, over 350,000. Um, they have social workers, uh, over 320 social workers, 54 supervisors. And they've been on the implementation journey of safety organized practice since 2010. So Miriam, I'm going to turn the um, webinar over to you. Great. Thank you, Susan. Good morning, everyone. So as Susan indicated, Sacramento County is uh, very large and it's extremely diverse. We have our work divided into four regions, and when we were rolling out our safety organized practice, it was very intensive and very focused by region. So we started in our north region of the county, and we began by training social workers, supervisors at the same time. We did a lot of work uh, in unit meetings with groups of supervisors and social workers. We had coaching. We did a lot of modeling as well. So myself as a manager, I went into my meetings with my supervisors. We would do mapping. We would do scaling questions. We tried to bring this to all levels uh, within the agency and the organization. This was not mandatory that folks uh, do safety organized practice. What was mandatory was that social workers are engaging with families and that they're really trying to bring the voice of the child and the parent to the work. However, by using safety organized practice and tools for engagement, then this is what we were trying to promote. So some of the things that Susan talked about are things that we worked really hard to do. So we, we incorporated scaling questions. Um, that being on a scale of 0 to 10, we would say 10 being the child is very, very safe in the home, and CPS or the agency can walk away. Um, and zero being there are so many safety concerns that this child needs to be removed immediately from the home. Whatever the boundaries are, we would, we would use scaling questions. We use three houses. We use a lot of safety networks, really trying to build supports up for families and doing mapping in the field where Susan showed you the three column maps. Um, and we would take that work into the field, into the home of the parents, and really try to engage them in developing safety plans and safety networks for their children. So one example of doing mapping in the field is the supervisors would take this work and really try to coach their their staff. And so I had one supervisor who went into the home with a social worker, and the supervisor was going to do the mapping. And she actually just said, I think the social worker is going to do this today, and handed the marker to the social worker, who then kind of took the baton and stood up. So in these cases, we would bring our paper, we would bring markers, we would bring whatever was needed to the house, and you're really trying to engage the, the family into um, building those supports and creating greater safety for their children. As part of our rollout, we started with the field work, um, which is a lot different than some counties do. So our hotline staff, the ones that re receive the calls of child abuse and neglect, they were actually just recently trained and exposed to a safety organized practice last week. So what has been happening uh, in the meantime is that when a social worker has the referral, actually at the first knock on the door, they're talking about what the department is worried about, and they're sharing the referral in a way that is using uh, some of the safety organized practice modeling for the families. 
Susan talked a lot about teaming as well. And in this county, we use team decision-making meeting. So we do a lot of team decision-making meetings. Those are all around placement episodes. So if there is going to be a imminent risk of removal, uh, we think, then we would do a, a team decision-making meeting. We use scaling questions in, in our meetings. We also bring in the three houses. So if a child is over the age of 10, they're allowed to participate in our uh, team decision-making meeting. And if they're over the age of 10, then you know they, they can come in. So one example is where we had a child that was a domestic violence situation. And we had one parent on the phone and the other parent in the room. And one child had done a three-house uh, um, three example with a social worker. The child was very afraid during the meeting, so the social worker asked permission to share the child's voice during the meeting. It was hugely impactful when the parents could hear what the child saw and felt when there was violence between them in the home and how that really affected the child. Um, and so in terms of the impact that this has on our social workers, the feeling is that they're really doing social work now. This has helped them to reconnect with their work. They feel that their uh, work has become much more valuable. They're amazed at what the kids can say and the information they're able to gather from children using these tools. Um, agency transparency has increased. We are actually telling families what we're worried about and what we would like to see happen before we can close a referral if it's an emergency response or walk away from a case or terminate dependency because we're being very clear with the behavior changes that, that we need to see, which then will show us that there's increase and improved safety with the family. So as Susan showed you on one of the slides, um, safety is defined as acts of protection over time. And the only way to really know how safe children are is if we involve families in developing those plans. So in our county, we've come up with a really great uh, family safety plan that follows the safety organized practice language. So we have safety threats. We have danger statements on there. And if, if we're using three houses, we're including that. We have child safety. So what is the voice of the child and what, what is the child going to do in order to be more safe in the home? We have safety networks on there. And what Susan talked about, you're really calling the people that are part of the safety network. We have them sign our safety plan. We have them put their phone number. They each know what they're accountable for um, as, part, as being a part of the safety network. Um, let's see, what else do we do? We uh, have these safety networks, so the circles that Susan showed you, we do that a lot as well. Part of what happens when uh, child protection comes into a family's home is that um, there's a lot of secrets. And a lot of times, families don't really know what's happening with the parents. And so one of the things that the safety networks really allows for us to do is have the parents share their story with more people so they can gain more support. And when families are isolated or they don't have supports, we find that their protective capacities or their ability to show protection over time is very, very limited. So the more people we can build around them, the more people they can include in their life, then we know that is creating greater safety for the children. So that's how we're creating buy-in and actively engaging families to participate in their case planning, participate in um, building up networks of support. So it's really about keeping children safe. We've also done a um, really good job at including some of the language and some of the information that we're getting in our documentation. Uh, this is not mandatory. However, social workers are really bringing in things such as the three houses, what the children are worried about, and what do they want to see happen in order for them to feel more safe in the home. So I think that's kind of a really brief uh, overview of what Sacramento County is doing. We're very excited by this practice, and we've seen just you know great things happen by uh, doing things a little bit differently. So thank you. Thank you, Marion.
Um, and so now the, um, my colleague from Lake County, um, and what we wanted to, to be able to demonstrate is while Sacramento is a fairly large county, um, Lake County, as you can see, is a very small county. So they have 18 social workers, four supervisors, a total child population of a little over 15,000, and yet the practices have been incredibly effective in a small rural county as well as in a large urban county. So my colleague Kathy Mays, who is the um, Child Welfare Director, Deputy Director in um, Lake County, is going to present a little bit about um, their perspective and experiences in Lake County. Thank you, Susan, and um, hello to everyone. Um, first of all, I want to start by um, thanking Sacramento County on doing such a great job of outlining all the different tools and, and the ways the SOP is used, because we do a lot of the same activities, so it was nice to hear her summary of how that's working in Sacramento County. I'm going to touch on a few areas uh, uh, in Lake County. Basically, I want to let you know that we began implementing safety, safety organized practice in 2010 as well. Um, we began with all of our staff receiving extensive SOP training, um, which really provided a great foundation for implementing the, the strategies and tools. Um, but we realized early on that we really needed to make the commitment to having ongoing coaching um, with, you know, from SOP experts, much like Sacramento, um, as well as creating our own in-house champion, you know, someone who's able on a daily basis to answer questions, model the practice in the field with the social workers, provide support, um, and just be the voice of SOP when, when you get off track, when the work gets overwhelming and you need to be brought back um, to the focus. And that's worked really well for us. Um, in Lake County, we start using SOP at the onset of our involvement with the family. Uh, the strategies and the tools are used throughout the life of the case, whether that be an investigation, a voluntary in-home case, or an out-of-home placement. Um, we found that providing family team meetings during investigations before even opening a case has helped bring the family, their support system, and community resources together early to prevent removal and potential court intervention to create really good quality concrete safety plans um, and to just better do a better job of engaging those families that may not need ongoing child welfare intervention but could benefit from differential response services. Um, when we have a different response representative present at a family team meeting, the parent is far more likely to accept those services and feel comfortable to step out and, and begin that relationship with another agency in the community. Um, we also are really flexible with our family team meetings, much like Sacramento. We will bring them into the home. Um, we will take them to a school site so that we can get school involved in them. We will have them at partner agencies. And we're equipped to pull them together on very short notice to address any immediate situations or just because it might meet the best needs of the family. We want to get them when they're ready, so we need to be available. Um, SOP has really been integrated in how we make casework decisions. Um, all major case decisions are made through group supervision using safety mapping and structured decision making. Um, social workers have stated that um, doing this has helped them feel more supported and secure in the decisions made especially when they're making those very difficult casework recommendations. They're not isolated in their work, and there's accountability on all levels within the agency. Um, when we talk about the impact of SOP in Lake County, increased collaboration between the department, families, and community support has been really dramatic. Um, an increase from eight documented family team meetings held in 2008 to over 130 in 2012 shows that we've made this really dramatic shift in how we approach the work with families. And I can guarantee the number now has increased even way beyond that. Um, families are now expecting their team meetings. Um, in a small county, the lake word gets around, and if a family isn't offered a team meeting, even in the beginning of an investigation sometimes, um, they want to know why. They, they, wanna, they want their meeting. It's been really kind of a fascinating phenomenon. Um, and then service providers will approach us when they really feel a need to advocate for a client and, and think that the team needs to come together. Um, one of our, our ER, our emergency response uh, supervisor, told us that often the investigating social workers will go into a home of a, a family that we've dealt with in the past, and they'll see their map up on the refrigerator or their safety plan. And the, and the family will bring it out and say, look, look, I have this. I've been doing this. And it's become kind of a mechanism for a shared language and, and shared um, way to communicate between the social workers and the, and the families. Um, 
Another impact has really been the increased involvement of children. Um, our children's voices are being heard in a way that's more powerful than we've ever experienced. Um, being able to bring their voice more clearly into court cases has helped us do a better job of keeping the court process focused on their best interests. The children are not as likely to get lost in all the legal maneuverings that can occur. And this has really had a positive impact on our relationship with the juvenile court judge. But more importantly, we have seen the child's voice have a powerful impact on their parents, much like Sacramento County shared. Um, to illustrate this, I'll share a case where SOP tools help the social worker and the child find that voice. We um, had to remove a 12-year-old child from her mother due to severe substance abuse. Uh, the mother consistently denied that her drug use was having any impact on her daughter, which is a common theme that we experience. She believed she was meeting the child's basic needs and that her daughter had no knowledge of the drug use at all, and also a common scenario. Um, in the course of the investigation, the social worker asked the child to draw her three houses. Um, in her house stories, she included a really very clear picture of her mother's drug use, the needles and spoons. Her mother passed out on the floor violence. She was really able to convey this, her fears through the drawings. The opportunity to discuss the picture with the child led to a deeper understanding by the social worker of what that child had experienced. She asked the child if she was willing to put her feelings into a letter to her mother, and the child agreed to do that. Together, the social worker and the child shared the three houses and the letter with the mom, and the impact was intense and immediate. You know, what skilled social workers had failed to accomplish through multiple attempts to use facts and reasoning with the mother, um, her child accomplished with a picture and a few heartfelt words. Um, that led to a powerful family team meeting with not only the child present sharing her story, but extended family members who were also struggling with their own denial of their substance abuse. In the end, not only did the mother get into treatment, but so did the grandmother, the aunt, and the uncle. And throughout the reunification process, the daughter attended all the team meetings and was part of all the key decisions. Um, in the end, reunification occurred sooner than we expected and was successful. Um, Mom has remained drug-free and is now um, a support to other parents in the community. Without using SOP strategies, our experience tells us that we likely would not have achieved the same outcome with this particular family. So, so these types of experiences have really helped social workers find meaning in the work they're doing and value in using the SOP strategies and tools. And then finally, I just want to add that we see SOP's impact on how the agency is able to be fully transparent with families in a supportive way. And by that I mean social workers are given the tools to be able to clearly define harm and danger, um, and they can share their worries and concerns in a way that is meant to support and respect families rather than cause families to feel blamed and judged. So there are no unstated issues, there's no hidden agendas, and even if families and the social workers disagree, that doesn't mean that the relationship ends. And that's had an incredible impact on the practice in Lake County. There's many, many more things I could talk about, but that's just a little picture of what's happening in Lake County. Thank you, Kathy. I really appreciate that. Um, and so for our final story from the field is um, Karen Ely. Karen Ely is with, she's a program manager in Butte County. And Butte County is kind of a mid-sized county in Northern California. As you can see, they have a total population of 45,000, give or take, children, um, 76 social workers and 12 supervisors. And Karen's going to talk a little bit um, a little bit about safety organized practice, but specifically an additional component that's been added that is called Red Teams. Um, which stands for um, review, um, evaluate, and direct, and um, and the um, and the success that they've been having in moving towards this direction of practice. So, um, Karen, thanks. Okay, um, as Susan said, Red Team is review, evaluate, direct, and it is we consider it to be a piece of our safety organized practice. We we were also early implementers of the practice. Um, and actually, while it says here we started in 2012, I think we really started in 2010, and allowed safety organized practice to kind of be a grassroots process in our county. Um, we were privileged to spend some time with Sue Lorbach through our uh, training academy at UC Davis. And she is the person who introduced us to this concept of red team. Red team really is a 
process to determine the response type to uh, referrals that we get. So we have uh, made the decision to use this process to determine whether to do a more traditional investigation or to do something that we are calling a family assessment. Previous to this process, we had one person making the determination on all our referrals, our, our intake supervisor. So when we began to implement uh, Red Team er, in late 2013, we determined who would be part of this process. And I'll, I'll speak to that a little bit later. Um, we have our Red Team meetings one time per day. It includes both of our offices and we used a video conferencing process in order to um, have everybody involved. Some of the participants that are in the team are our child welfare investigative supervisors, our child welfare intake supervisor. We have partners from behavioral health, our local domestic violence treatment services program. We have um, public health. And we also have um, our targeted early intervention staff as part of that group. We find that by having that kind of rather broad group all there discussing the referrals that have come in, it really enhances the richness of the expertise that we get when making that decision. Because our partners come with a different focus. We've also found that they often have knowledge of many of the families that we are reviewing. So it, again, is a really important piece to getting the whole picture so we can make a determination about the family. Uh, our goal, one of our goals is to continue to enhance safety organized practice in our county, also to provide transparency both for our clients but also for our service providers. We found over the years that people are a little bit confused about how child welfare works. And by having some of our partners at this very, very early piece before we get involved with families, it has really assisted in um, uh, broadening their knowledge. Um, so we again, this is a real complement to safety organized practice. We use the consultation and information gathering framework that Susan talked about earlier in the presentation to gather and organize our information for, from this meeting. So it begins the process of using SOP language from the very beginning of the case. We then enter this, this framework into our computer system, and it's available to our social workers to use throughout the life of the case. And they then will add information or change information as they move through the process. One of the other things that the red team has done is it continues to model for staff the process of group supervision. It, it again, uh, provides importance that more than one person should be talking about families. And while this piece is really about staff and families aren't involved in Red Team, it still uses the same process since our, our intake social workers are the ones who come in and present the information um, and our, our partners and uh, supervisors are making the decisions. It makes for a much more dynamic process and um, has been really successful for, uh, for our organization. Some of the outcomes are that we have developed this new process of family assessment in, co in uh, complement with our traditional investigations. And we find that it's really engaging families early by um, by contacting them first rather than just showing up at their door. We've been doing this process of Red Team for about six months, and the word is starting to get out in the community that we're out there to help families rather than just be the organization who takes their children away. Um, we've started to have some families contact us about their own issues and that they have thanked us for uh, beginning to use this more inclusive approach. Um, our family assessment process that is kind of the second step after Red Team enhances in-home services by the use of a targeted early intervention program so we can get people into services without bringing them into child welfare. 
And then also through this process, we're finding that things that were formerly identified as risks and really were the focus of the investigation turn out to be complicating factors that um, are important to know but aren't the key features. Uh, we also feel like, um, and our social workers have echoed this, that it feels like they're being able to return more to social work, the, the style of social work that brought them into this field. Um, so in our county, we are finding we have, when we have staffed, we have staffed 281 cases in our red team. And this is out of 927 uh, calls during a three-month time period. And of those cases that were staffed, 219 were open for investigation, and 131 of those were assigned to the family assessment track. 88 were assigned to a traditional investigation. So that's quite a large piece are going on this uh, more early engagement track uh, rather than the, the traditional. Um, and we have found that a number of our families are being diverted from child welfare into our service provider components. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have a partnership with our domestic violence provider, and they have uh, engaged with eight of our families without child welfare being involved. And our targeted early intervention program has engaged with 44 of the families uh, without child welfare being involved. We think that's pretty impressive and are excited to continue this process. Thanks. Thank you, Karen. Um, we want to shift now a little bit to focusing on the implementation of safety organized practice. Um, I think one of the huge challenges in, um, in any child welfare organization or jurisdiction is um, how do you implement a new um, process for doing the work? And so, um, and that's no different uh, here in California than it is anywhere else. So I think some of the main shifts that really um, uh, supported the work and engaged and encouraged and excited social workers to be a part of safety organized practice was really the shift um, from uh, social worker as case manager to social worker as practitioner. And um, I think that um, the respect and the credibility of social workers as practitioners had often sort of been uh, a little bit negated in terms of just being considered case managers. And really, the work of social work practitioners is so critical to the change that every interaction a social worker has with a family is about an intervention and a change. And social work, uh, safety organized practice definitely supports that. Um, what we often hear from social workers around the practice is I'm finally getting back to doing good social work practice um, like I really went into the field for. So I think that's one of the key elements that has really supported implementation of safety organized practice is just excitement from a grassroots level. I think some of the other key successes has been um, ensuring that there's leadership support and commitment from jurisdictions and counties that have been implementing. So having a clear plan, a clear vision, an implementation team for supporting the implementation of the practice, for providing a communication strategy, a feedback loop, a refinement of the work that's being done, and then really a commitment to the ongoing um, organizational um, change and system changes within the organization based on the learning. So moving to a learning organization, and as a learning organization, making the ongoing changes um, to the system, including policies um, uh, that support the work of child welfare. Um, I think another key component for success of implementation has been community engagement. Um, and community engagement also includes engagement of partners, so mental health, and specifically engagement of the court partners. Having good, strong relationships and communication with the court and how case plans and court reports um, begin to look differently because they're more behavior-based um, in the information that's being provided to the courts um, is an important element to communicate and get support and collaboration um, to support that shift in practice. Um, one of the things we really did use as a framework for implementation in California is uh, implementation science. And so one of the things that we really know about implementation science 
um, that was a change for us um, in the way that we were doing our work traditionally was around training and coaching. Um, and that we really moved with safety organized practice and the implementation to focus on a huge component of coaching um, to support those uh, classroom days of learning, um, but then how to move that classroom learning into practice with families in the field was really critical, and that work is uh, supported by um, coaching in each of the counties in the north. Um, and I think that uh, you've heard some reference in each of the county presentations to that, um, but it really was key to, um, uh, I think, successful implementation. One of the things Uh, this slide really demonstrates, again, it's information um, that comes out of implementation science, and this really comes out of the field of education, was if you um, only uh, do classroom training, um, even with demonstration and practice, you only get to about 5% of transfer of learning. But when you add in coaching, there's a 95% um, of learning to practice. And so, again, that coaching component is really critical. So I think I kind of covered this slide, so we're going to just move to the next one. And uh, one of the things that came out of the work and was we were fortunate to receive some funding from Casey Family Programs is the development of a child welfare coaching toolkit. And this is something that you'll see at the end um, that's available on our website um, that you can download a copy of it. If you want a hard copy, you can also purchase one, but um, you can just download this information off the website. And um, the coaching toolkit, again, provides some key guidance to how do you support the building and coaching to skill development in the field. Um, and I think oftentimes we think that coaching is something that is, um, may not have necessarily a high level of skill to it. But one of the learnings I think we have is that it's not really easy to, um, to coach effectively and to coach to skill development. It's often, I often, often relate it to look at case plans um, in terms of case plans being behaviorally focused, that we talk about that and it seems like a concept that um, uh, is easy to do, but when you really get into it, it's really difficult. And so the coaching toolkit is a way of providing some guidance to doing that. So now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, um, Holly Bowers. And she's going to talk a little bit about the evaluation work that we've been doing uh, with Safety Organized Practice. Thank you, Susan. Um, hello, everyone. This is going to be a very brief um, overview of some of the various evaluation tools that have been developed um, to really look at how the different SOP strategies are being implemented um, really throughout California and to understand how these particular practices um, and tools are being used and how effective they are in deepening social work practice to lead to um, many of the practice improvements you've heard um, everyone else speak to. So the first um, set of tools that I, I want to really highlight is the practice profiles, what we term practice profiles. Um, these practice profiles, profiles were developed by a work group that consisted of researchers and practitioners um, nationally and actually internationally. Um, it took about three to four, three years to really get in development. The main purpose in highlighting them here today is to show you that these tools were developed to really help with the transfer of learning piece. Um, and using coaching. And so there are six different practice profiles related to, um, to safety organized practice. And I won't go through each of those. This one is just to highlight, for instance, harm and danger risk statements. So we spoke to those being. And so the practice profiles were really here developed to see how you could get, you know, if you get someone who participates in a three-day training, around safety organized practice. And um, in the beginning slide when we talked about evaluation, there was the pre and the post and the follow-up tests. 
Well, we also wanted to look at how do we get skills that can, that can describe in behavioral concrete ways of a practitioner deepening their practice in these particular um, tools and strategies. Um, so harm and danger statements is one. And you can see you could start at emergent practice, accomplished practice, all the way to distinguished. And we've had a lot of fun this last year working with supervisors um, to use these tools with workers to really deepen practice and their strategies so that they could see where, how do I get um, you know, from an emergent practice to accomplished practice and really help with goal setting. So these have been really um, great tools we found for professional development and helping with continuous quality improvement efforts. And I'm not going to go into detail about each of the tools. There's a lot we could talk about. Um, we do have resources available, um, so definitely contact us if you want to get more information. We can go ahead and go through all of them. Thank you. Um, another tool that was developed alongside the practice profiles are case reading tools. Um, and these have been getting great feedback from counties as far as acquiring some information about how they're doing with implementation of SOP. So first, with the case reading tool, um, there is, I think, this really essential component, which is the worker interview. So the current worker is interviewed, um, who's the worker of the case, and they're interviewed. And as you can see on here, a lot of the practices that were asking the workers to do with families are also being asked um, in these evaluation techniques. So for instance, a scaling question um, and asking them to scale themselves and how they see themselves in using the different safety organized practice tools and strategies. Um, what's working well for them? What needs improvement? So um, the way we've used this is we've had people who are external, um, meaning that they're not working in the county. So many of them are our coaches, and they go out into the county, and they meet with these workers, and then they review the case. And this worker interview piece is really important. The next piece of information is really looking at the case. So um, I think the part to highlight here is really looking at how is, um, for instance, this particular county is using structured decision making. So when, it, when is that being used to help with case planning? Um, in what ways is it being um, documented that it's been used and not just being used you know, as a requirement, um, as part of the county requirement to do it, but how is it really informing the case planning? And then the next areas are really looking at engagement, which you've heard so much about, really the involvement of children and families and the different um, community partners. And you can see in here um, the different element and de um, definitions is looking at how is solution-focused questioning being used, how is input from the child and youth being collected. And I will say that from practice profiles and case reviews, um, any tools that are used, one area that has really been deepened um, and has grown to improve is really this involvement of the child and youth in the case planning. And then the next piece we have the, is the critical thinking. Um, again, that organization of assessment and information um, and using a balanced assessment. So how are you seeing that in the case plan? Um, what we've also found really helpful is when people are doing their practice profiles, and they use the case file review tool, supervisors who sit down with their workers and say this is where you could document this information in the case um, has really helped, again, deepen that practice and help people grow in their practice to that distinguished level. And then the third level is really that increased safety. So how is safety um, being documented in the case file review? So again, just Again, sharing the safety maps, the, plan, the safety um, goals and the plan and the safety network. And how can you not only do the practice, but how can we document it and make sure it's in the case? Just like Susan said earlier, um, you know, if you have different workers involved in the case or someone leaves, it's really important to have that documentation. And I think this is really also um, what we're finding from the field and the stories we're hearing is helping with court reports um, to have these strategies documented and have you know, the safety network in the court, the court report and the plan. Um, so there is consistency in practice.
So from this case file review tool, um, this is just sharing you one of the cases that uh, one of the counties that was examined. So they had about six of their cases looked at by these two um, different outside coaches. Um, and they went in and met with the county, and then these were some of the takeaways for them. So after you do the case file review with some randomly selected cases, they then were able to um, come back with the county and say, here's what's working well, um, these are some of our worries, and this is what needs to happen. We think, in our opinion, this is what needs to happen to really deepen the practice. Um, so this has been really validating for counties to participate in this process. So even though we call it evaluation, um, I think part of it is also that continuous quality improvement where it's a feedback loop and people can see, um, oh, we need to work on harm and danger statements or maybe we need to find better ways to engage children and families. Um, and then it's just highlighted in purple, um, what's showing up as purple here is kind of saying, you know, for this particular county, for what worked well, is it's helped me explain what's going on and to be able to teach the court um, and attorneys about their safety. So just to highlight how I think that court piece, we're also finding from our evaluation and collecting information how safety organized practice is really helping connect with the courts and attorneys. And so now I'll turn it over to Susan. Thank you. So um, again, I think one of the things just in closing is that as a form of critical thinking, reflective practice was one of the most important um, components and elements I think that social workers can use. Reflective practice cannot only make the social work more relevant to the particular needs of each client, but can also genuinely improve a social worker's understanding of theory and how to apply theory to practical situations. And I think safety organized practice, one of the main components, is really about reflective practice. It's about having collaborative, working in collaboration with partners, families, and networks and to be reflective about the work that we're doing. So oftentimes we say it's about be slowing things down to really examine the work that we're doing and how we can continue to improve our work as we uh, try to provide safety and support to children and families. Um, there's a variety of resources that are available. Some of them are here. And um, lastly, people are certainly welcome just to send um, an email uh, to me, and you'll see that come up on the slide as well. We're happy to um, send any uh, information that people might want some additional resources for. So I'll turn it back to you. Yes, and this is our time for our um, question um, and answer segment, and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our operator, um, um, Karina, who will go ahead and get us started in making sure that you all understand how you can ask a question. Thank you. And once again, if you have a question, please signal by pressing star 1 on your telephone keypad. If you are using a speakerphone, please make sure mute function is turned off to allow your signal to reach your equipment. A voice prompt on the phone line will indicate when your line is open. Please state your name before posing your question. Again, that is star 1, and we'll pause for a moment to assemble the queue. And Karina, while you're assembling the, um, the queue, I will go ahead and ask the first question that has come in through our chat. And this question is for Susan. Um, was there a reduction in the number of children who came into care post-implementation of the SOP approach? Well, I have to say that's a difficult question to answer. Um, I think uh, we have generally saw a reduction in kids in care a couple of years ago as we started, um, although I have to say in this last year in California, we began to see a rise again um, in terms of kids' uh, uh, referrals and children entering care. But I will say um, one of the outcomes that's very clear is that decisions that are made around um, uh, removal of children is done with much in a much more strategic way and done with a great deal of clarity around what the presenting harm and danger issues are, so what the parents' actions are or the caregivers' actions are that are putting that child's um, safety uh, in or in danger, at risk or in danger. And I also think the clarity into which the agency is responding and supporting families 
to help them address those behaviors that need to be changed to keep that child safe is, um, is much clearer. I know several years ago I would sit in a meeting and um, the facilitator of the meeting would ask the family why they're there or why they're participating in the meeting or why their child was in care. And people would all kind of look at each other without real clarity about why the child was in care and not have real clarity about what they needed to do as the caregiver of that child to have the child return home. And I think that that rarely happens now, that even if the child is removed, again, there's real clarity about the, why that child's removed and what that family and the family network needs to do to have the child to return home safely. Thank you, Susan. I have one more question um, that I can go ahead and ask you while Karina is queuing up for our um, other questions. But can you also um, explain or give some examples of building the support around the client's life, um, what you mean by that? Sure. I, I'm actually going to turn that, I think, over to the counties. Um, and so I'm going to put Miriam in, from Sacramento a bit on the spot because I think that's one of the things that um, the counties have been working directly around building, building those networks of support. Sure. Can you restate the question, please? Yes. Um, can you explain or give some examples of building su the support around the client's life? Like, what does that mean? Yes. So I think what that that means, at least in Sacramento and from what I've heard from the other presenters, is how using the safety networks you bring family, you bring natural supports that the parents might have in their life, say they are involved in a church or a religious organization, you bring those in if they have neighbors that they would like to call on, if you have family members that they have been estranged from and they would like to really bring them forward to have some supports for the family. It would be including people that the family can begin to trust and rely on to increase safety for the children in their, um, in their care or so that they can get the children back in their care. Um, most often it's where you try and ask the parents who do you know and who would be willing to be a part of your plan and who are you willing to talk about this with. Um, also, I think the children can identify some people as well that are important to them that they would like to see. So it's just a, it's just a way of creating a greater support system that's driven by the family with the family because child welfare hopefully is not going to be in their lives um, for long or for a, over a long period of time. And so we really want families to rely on the safety that they already have but be able to expand on it in a very thoughtful, organized way so everybody knows what their responsibility is. Thanks, Miriam. Sure. Karina, um, are we ready for the next question? We have no questions over the phone lines at this time. Okay, thank you, Karina. I will go ahead with the next question. Um, and the next few questions have to do with the elements of coaching um, that you all talked about during the presentation. Um, the first question is, how did they implement the coaching? And um, who did the coaching? Uh, thank you. So um, coaching started um, because safety organized practice was a fairly new um, uh, practice for California. We actually did a lot of coaching via um, technology because some of the people who um, were more experienced at the practice were in Massachusetts and in Minnesota. And so a lot of counties, we, uh, counties implemented in clusters. And there were regular phone conferences of coaching that took place um, over the phone that provided some guidance and depth to practice. Um, at the same time we were doing that, what we were doing is building external to the child welfare agency coaches that the, um, the Northern Training Academy hired as instructors and coaches. So they were external to the agency who could go in after the training occurred and provide that additional coaching uh, to supervisors and to individual social workers. The coaching would take place as could be part of unit meetings, case consultations, and even coaches went out in the field with social workers to work with families in the moment around, again, 
the information consultation safety mapping framework. Um, and then as that was happening, we are at the same time then training and supporting supervisors in their role as coach. So we have a coaching institute that's specifically for supervisors to build coaching skills in supervisors. Um, and as supervisors have honed their coaching skills and their skills in safety organized practice, the capacity building piece will be for supervisors and lead workers to, um, to serve as coaches for the um, newer or less experienced social workers as they continue to develop their skills. Thank I would say so one thing about coaching is there's no magic way of, um, of providing or building capacity for coaching. Um, and the other thing, sort of lesson learned about coaching is that it doesn't necessarily require a lot of time for coaching, but it does require very focused and very skill-based um, guidance in coaching um, to be most effective. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I actually have a question for um, for Karen, um, and that has to do with your red teams. How did you decide how cases are referred to red team for staffing? Okay. Um, well, actually, all referrals are referred to red team. Uh, we began with uh, a discussion about how to determine that. And anything that, and we started with the cases that rose to the legal level of potential child abuse or neglect and, and started with that group. So those were our what we call 10-day referrals, where we have 10 days to go out and make contact. We have since added our immediate response uh, referrals. We review those kind of the next day. So they've already responded, but we still review them. And then we are in the process of adding our referrals that we traditionally evaluate out and don't go out on. Thanks, Karen. Um, Karina, do we have any questions on the phone lines? We have none. OK. Let me go ahead and see if I can queue up for the next question. So what plans are going to be put in place to provide training to judges and attorneys? SOP involves a fundamental change in thinking for them, and there is a need for training for them as well. Um, Susan, is that a question you can um, help us answer? Sure. Uh, we've done a variety of things around training um, judges and lawyers. One of the things we um, did a couple of years ago was we put on for the North State with something called um, putting safety and risk on trial. Um, and so that was really a day of providing information about uh, to specifically targeting judges and lawyers. Um, it was framed and led by judges and lawyers um, around describing both structured decision making as well as safety organized practice. So um, two, uh, two practices um, that are key, I think, in identifying uh, and determining risk and safety for families um, that really the court system didn't have a lot of information about. So that was something that was specifically um, targeting that population. We had over the course of two days somewhere around 350 um, judges and lawyers that attended that. Then um, I think since then what we've done in a county jurisdiction by jurisdiction is we have um, a lawyer who is very versed in safety organized practice as well as coaches and practitioners as well as county um, uh, uh, child welfare directors meet in um, either half day trainings or brown bag lunches to really talk with the court around um, the type of system changes that it's going to take. So it's been sort of a combination of the larger macro approach to the work and to working with the courts and, um, and providing information and guidance to really the um, uh, jurisdiction by jurisdiction working with the courts um, and the legal system around providing information. I know Kathy Mays has done quite a bit in Lake County, and so for an example, I'll, I'll turn it over to Kathy to see if she wants to add an example. Well, let me think about that. Um, 
I think, well, one of the things we're doing here right now, I and mean, we've had attorneys involved in family team meetings, and um, that can be really powerful and wonderful and really takes the family, you know, it helps the family to connect quicker with their plan and get on board with what we all believe needs to happen, and, and, and agreement gets reached. Um, and sometimes that hasn't gone so well when you have attorneys who want to make the family team meeting an adversarial kind of setting. So we've been working really hard to try to nurture those relationships with attorneys so that we can have some ground rules around that in the team meeting so they can be the most effective um, you know, place to create that plan together. Um, right now we're in the process of um, basically giving our attorneys and our judge a cheat sheet kind of of all the, you know, what's entailed in, in, in safety oversight practice. So when things come up in a report talking about a team meeting or, you know, the different activities we do, um, they can re they can look and reference what it is, you know, because they're not doing it every day. They don't remember. Um, and it clarifies all the different aspects of the casework that we're doing that may be new to them. And, you know, so that's, that's something that we're working on because we found a need for that. Um, it's just really an ongoing conversation and process, and um, I think we're ready for another round. We've had trainings here, and our attorneys have attended, and I think it's time to do that again because you need to always refresh and remind and, and keep the conversation going. Thanks, Kathy. Okay. Karina, do we have any questions um, on the phone line? We have no questions. Okay, you guys are keeping me very busy here um, on the live chat. And so our next question is, um, can you describe this, um, the structure of group supervision um, in the counties using SOP? Sure. So again, everything um, is really using the same, uh, I would say, two major elements. One is the three questions. What do you worry about? What's working well? And what are we going to do next? And the other is the information consultation safety mapping framework. So um, group supervision works very much the same way, is that um, a social worker will present a case um, as part of the group uh, uh, unit meeting with the supervisor and all the social workers. And then instead of just one social worker and one um, supervisor making a decision about the, um, the work of that particular, working with that particular family, it really is a, a group process where every, this, while the social worker is presenting, there is, you want to create an atmosphere of learning um, and, um, and sharing and exchanging of ideas. One of the things that we have found with group supervision that is really critical is that we really learn critical thinking skills by listening to other people ask questions. Um, by listening to other people, have different perspectives, and by sorting out information among ourselves about what are the different options, what are people's thoughts about it. I think one of the things about group supervision, which is also a piece I think that's also reflected in the red team, is that um, oftentimes information can be missed if it's left to one or two people to make decisions um, about the information that they have. Um, and so I think group supervision is a way of moving um, practice out of isolation into collaboration. It's a good way of moving to a higher level of critical thinking within the organization. And it also takes the pressure, I think, off of the one social worker and the one supervisor for having to be uh, the expert and or having to always make the right decisions, that it really helps uh, alleviate, I think, a great deal of the pressure that um, social workers and supervisors feel around um, uh, making those hard decisions and making the right decision because it's done in collaboration with other people, with other experts in the field, and having that, um, again, collaborative experience in looking at all different aspects of information that get presented as part of the case. What a comprehensive answer. Um, thank you so much for that. I think we have time for one more question. Um, Karina, do you, we have anything on the phone lines? We do not. 
Okay, this is going to be our um, last question um, that we have time for. Any questions that are um, that we weren't able to get to today, we will um, develop a question and answer document that we'll um, post on the NRC for in-home services um, website, and that will be available for, um, for you to review in the next week or so. Um, the last question, um, I think this one is probably a good one just in terms of helping us kind of close out. Um, but Susan, can you tell us who developed SO and has the practice model as a whole been research tested, found to be evidence based? Um, I think, uh, as I as we sort of talked about in the very beginning, safety organized practice is a combination of a variety of practices um, that most of which are evidence based. So um, when you look at motivational interviewing, there's a huge body of research behind that. When you look at solution focused interviewing, there's research and support around that. When you look at SDM, structured decision making, there's research and evaluation of that. So what we've done is really taken some of those best practices. And while they were not developed um, with the exception of SDM, they were not really developed for child welfare. They, most of them were really developed for mental health. Um, but we've taken those principles, the same with cultural humility, which has, again, a body of research behind that. We've taken those elements and shaped it in a way that really supports um, really a solution-focused approach to working with families um, with some specific tools and guidance. I think one of the things that happened before when we talked about um, uh, uh, solution-focused interviewing or we talked about motivational interviewing or we talked about engaging children, there were not specific tools or strategies for doing that. So social workers would say things like, well, I engage the family or, I, you know, I, I ask the children, but yet, the quality and depth of information we might get was not um, as, as much as we would hope. And so I think by taking some of these evidence-based practices and really thinking about how to use the principles of those practices for child welfare has really helped shape safety organized practice. And I would say it's evolving. I think one of the things about being a learning organization is that you're constantly looking at how you can continue to grow and learn as an organization and in your practice. So the area that I think um, trauma-informed services is one of the pieces that, while we address it a bit in safety organized practice, we certainly haven't moved it to the level of depth that we think that needs to occur in working with children and families in child welfare. So it's a piece of work that continues to evolve, as it should when we're looking at good, solid social work practice. Thanks, Susan. And now we're going to go ahead and turn it over to Pam Day, who's going to go ahead and um, provide some information about how the NRC for in-home services um, can help um, you and your states and tribal welfare um, agencies. Pam? Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. Um, just very quickly, as we said in the beginning, the National Resource Center is um, available to assist with training and technical assistance for state and tribal child welfare agencies. and. Um, our activities include sponsoring webinars like this one, um, providing technical assistance to states and tribes on topics such as this one, as well as many related to um, keeping children safely in their in their homes and communities. Um, and we also support peer-to-peer -peer learning and provide information, um, curricula, and access to good training. So we, we encourage you to continue to call on us as, um, as you need to. Um, we also just want to thank our, our panelists who have just been um, superb, <laughs> just terrific. We want to thank um, uh, Susan, uh, Miriam, Marion, uh, Kathy, Karen, uh, Holly, uh, and our, our webinar team as well for a very comprehensive and thoughtful a real life example of an effort to improve practice and outcomes for children and families. We love the tools. We love the examples. Uh, we love that this is evolving, and um, we'd love to check back with you, Susan, in another little while to hear more. So thank you so much. Um, Cynthia, do you want to give them the final info? Um, yes. Just to let everyone know that the webinar posting um, for today will be archived on the NRC for In-Home Services website. You have the link there. Um, if you want more information on training and technical assistance through the NRC, you can contact um, Pam Day. She's our senior project consultant, and um, you see her email address um, there as well. 
On the behalf of the NRC for In-Home Services, we want to thank you for joining today's webinar. If you have additional questions about the safety organized practice model or would like to learn more about training and technical assistance from the NRC for In-Home Services, the contact information for PAM Day was listed for your convenience. Immediately following today's webinar, we will send out a short online survey and hope that you will take a moment to provide us with your feedback. We hope that you learned something new today. And this concludes today's webinar. We want to thank you and have a great afternoon.